Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Monday the 15th of May. Now, I've just been reading a really quite interesting study indicating that the doses of vitamin D that people have been taking are probably way too small. Now, this is based on the idea that these authors are giving us that in a normal sunny day outside will produce 25,000 units of vitamin D a day. Now, compare that to the current UK government uh, a recommended amount of uh, 400 units per day. It makes it look really quite laughable. But this is based on good evidence, which is what we want. At the end of this video, we'll be asking why the authorities aren't keeping up to date with the evidence. We have these medical researchers doing this research. We're supposed to be evidence-based, and yet, are we evidence-based? Well, I'll leave you to answer that question. Uh, are we evidence-based? Are we fully up-to-date? Perhaps uh, certain areas could do with updating in national policies. Now, there's quite a few preparations that are really quite cheap, and vitamin D is one of them. <laughs> uh, big pharma can't make a lot of money out of this. Now, correctly, many of you have challenged me and said, well, wait a minute, vitamin D is actually quite expensive. Yeah, we are being ripped off for vitamin D very often by some uh, suppliers. But if there was competition, the point is there's no patent on it. So lots of manufacturers, when we start taking more vitamin D, as we will, as the health benefits of this become incontrovertible, pretty un incontrovertible now, more manufacturers can start making it, getting the right quality, and that'll drive the prices down because it's not patented. Anyone can make it. No, any vitamin D, any pharmaceutical manufacturer could make huge amounts. Anyway, let's get straight on to the research. Really interesting stuff. Uh, here's the original paper here. Now, you can get most of this paper. Um, you can download quite a lot of this paper, and it's so interesting. Um, it gives quite a lot of the historical background if you read the introduction. What happened back in the 1920s and 30s when people started realising the importance of vitamin D for things like treating tuberculosis and psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, they actually gave doses that were way too high, like 10 times too high, and that's why people became paranoid about the higher doses of vitamin D. So we went down to like minuscule doses. But we'll look at that as we go through. Um, stick with it because it really is very important, this video, I think. Uh, daily oral dosing of vitamin D3 to 5,000 to 50,000 units a day. Hospitalized patients. And now these were patients admitted to a, um, a psychiatric facility, often for severe uh, men mental illness. But it meant they were able to monitor all the vitamin D levels of the patients that came in, offer supplements and titrate it up. So it's a really, really good sample, actually. I think it's a very nice piece of research written up mostly by the psychiatrists concerned. Um, insights from a seven year experience. Now, this is published in Steroid Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, uh, that well-known journal with a snappy title. But it is a serious uh, peer reviewed journal. I have no uh, qualms about that uh, at all. Um, now, this is carried out in Dayton and Cincinnati, Ohio, so it's published from the work order in the United States. They say vitamin D is a hormone produced in the skin, which is true, it is, uh, in amounts estimated up to 25,000 international units a day. So if we were like uh, hunter-gatherers or living outside like we're supposed to, or agricultural labourers, or if I'm spending all day at summer in my allotment, then I should be making about 25,000 units a day. Much higher than a lot of people think. That is a really quite a large amount of vitamin D that's been made in this natural physiological situation, which is probably a pretty good comparator to take. Uh, the actions of ultraviolet B uh, radiation, as we know, on the skin. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is common, the authors say, and we know that's true. Lack of uh, exposure to the sun present in very few food sources. No, it's not surprising. Surprising. Deficiency is strongly linked to an increase in a multitude of diseases, the authors correctly say. And we've looked at some on this uh, on this channel before. I haven't prepared this, so I'll see what I can remember. Immunity, of course. Heart disease. Multiple sclerosis. Autoimmune disease. Colon cancer, for sure. Um, low levels of vitamin D are highly correlated with colon cancer. And probably prostate cancer and breast cancer as well. We could go on if my memory was better, but we've looked at quite a few examples. Wide range of health conditions. Vitamin D is remarkably important for keeping good health and preventing disease. Several of which have been historically shown to dramatically improve with ultraviolet exposure to the skin. Like in the old days, they used to put the TB patients out on the balcony. 
or supplements can also be effective. Uh, these diseases included, now this is the examples that they give here, asthma, psoriasis, the inflammation of the skin, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, I've looked after patients in absolute agony for years with rheumatoid arthritis, causing great deformities and eventually essential paralysis as the joints basically seize up. And the idea that I could have helped these patients pain by giving them high doses of vitamin D, and I didn't, because we didn't know about it, but, but why didn't we know about it? You know, this is not prehistory I'm talking about. Um, it just seems such a pity that these patients weren't helped with this very, very safe, very, very cheap and efficacious intervention. Um, very, very sad. Tuberculosis, of course, uh, as an infection disease, infectious disease. We know about bacterial infection. Of course, we've looked at the potential efficacy against viral infections. And we've looked at research that shows that people that are low in vitamin D do get more viral, respiratory viral infections, or influenza anyway, that's been clearly demonstrated. Well, patients in our hospital have been routinely screened. Why aren't we doing this in the UK? We should be screening everyone for vitamin D because it's so important. And they were doing that from July 2011 to I think it was uh, 2018 that went through to. Offered supplement to correct deficiency, 4,700 emissions, and most of them agreed to it. And of course, we also know that vitamin D deficiency predisposes towards depression, seasonal affective disorder. So uh, psychiatric patients, as all patients, as in all people, can benefit from, from, from this. So it's good to see that that was, uh, that was done. Vast majority agreed to supplementation. Typically, patients had uh, 5,000 to 10,000 units a day. That's 125 micrograms to 250 micrograms. And remember, the UK government guideline, I think, is, is it 400 a day now? It's, it just makes it look completely laughable that we're advising such low amounts uh, where they were giving 5,000 to 10,000 a day, 125 micrograms to 250 micrograms. Uh, and now some patients, due to disease concerns, were given 20,000 to 50,000 units a day. That's uh, 500 micrograms to 1.25 1.25 milligrams, 1,250 micrograms. So really quite high daily doses um, to try and treat particular uh, diseases such as psoriasis and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I think. Uh, no cases of vitamin D induced hypercalcemia. Hyper high calcium in the blood. That's what people worry about. They had no cases. I think this is important to emphasize. Some, most patients are on five to 10,000 a day. Some patients are on 20 to 50,000 a day. No complications at all. None. No complications at all reported in any of the patients. A marked clinical improvement. Uh, three patients with psoriasis who had the higher dose. Marked clinical improvement. No adverse reactions. Now, analysis of 1400, uh, 418 inpatients that they looked at recently. They were there long enough to develop blood levels of 74.4 nanograms a mil, so reasonably high. It showed a mean uh, vitamin D concentration level of 118.9 nanograms per mil. This would normally be considered high, but as we say, no adverse reactions. And the range in these patients was 74 to, 800, uh, so to 384. Now, here's the key thing. In these patients who had such high levels of uh, vitamin D, the blood calcium, the mean was uh, 9.6 milligrams per deciliter. And the range is uh, that the range went from 8.6 to 10.7. And the normal range is normally 8.5 to 10.5. So this is quite acceptable. Now, you do see variations in range a bit. Uh, I, I take my normal ranges from um, Davidson's Principle and Practice of Medicine. So um, I think we can be fairly sure that is the accurate normal range. So basically, we can say this is essentially within within range, certainly not high enough to cause any problems. Now, they also took a comparator group over the years of people that didn't take vitamin D. Uh, they had an average level of a uh, mean level of 27.1, so way, way lower. Remember, the average uh, vitamin D levels in the people uh, taking vitamin D were um, 118.9. So that was the people taking vitamin D, 118. Uh, the people not taking vitamin D, it was uh, 27.1, so way, way lower. Now, what about their calcium? Well, it was 9.5. 
So the people on these huge doses of vitamin D, their calcium was 9.6, average, mean, which is okay. Uh, people not taking vitamin D, 9.5. So we can see basically it's the same. There's no statistical difference between those. Parathyroid hormone levels. Now, parathyroid hormone is a hormone that's released in response to low calcium levels. The D3 users, it was a uh, 24.2. The non-D3 users was 30.2, indicating that the non-D3 users were actually um, releasing some uh, some parathyroid hormone, parathormone, to try and keep their calcium levels up, which I thought was interesting. Now, in summary, the, the, authors, uh, the authors said this in summary, long-term supplementation with vitamin D3 in doses ranging from five to 50,000 units a day appears to be safe. This is what the authors say. Conclusion, daily oral intake of vitamin D3 ranging from 5,000 up to 60,000 in few cases for several years for several years was well tolerated in say and safe in both our patients and staff so the staff got not realized this was a good thing going on here and they they started taking it as well um so there we go there the conclusions i'll paste all those in the uh in the um description of course patients and staff the mean vitamin d level blood levels in our patients appears to be taken taken around 12 months to plateau so they were giving patients five to 10,000 units a day and it was still taking. The vitamin D levels went up for a whole year before they plateaued. Now that to me indicates that the vitamin D levels were so slow, it took a year to get up to the levels that the body wanted it to, to be at. So 5,000 to 10,000 units a day for a year before the levels plateaued out. And how did they plateau out? Um, the average vitamin D concentration in the blood, patients taking 10,000 units of vitamin D a day at 12 months, uh, the vitamin D was up to 96 nanograms a mil. But then they carried on for another, uh, another what, four months and uh, basically uh, the, the plateaued. So at 16 months up to 97 nanograms per mil. Again, all with no adverse reactions reported at all. Currently considered upper limit is 100 nanograms a mil. The question is, given that we're supposed to be producing this 25,000 units a day when we're outside, is this level accurate? Does this need to be changed by the medical authorities? It's an interesting question. No question at all in my mind that authorities around the world, health authorities, UK Health Security Agency or whatever snappy title they have these days, should increase the recommended amount of vitamin D. The current recommended amounts, in my view, are way too low. Now, of course, I can't tell you what to take. You have to see your own doctor. It should ideally be titrated according to your blood levels. Currently, I'm taking 8,000 units per day with 200 micrograms of vitamin K2. That's what I'm taking. Can't tell you what to take. You've got to see your own doctor for that. I am not your doctor. Um, but does this need to be changed up the way? Well, it would appear so from this data. Now, did these authors have any conflicts of interest? Well, the authors had no conflicts of interest to disclose. Were they funded by some external, hugely rich, greedy corporate organisation, as certain preparations may have been advocated for by? The research was performed without external funding. When, oh, when are we going to start using inexpensive preparations where there's evidence of efficacy? Why aren't governments around the world changing their recommendations based on evidence like this and, and, and much more evidence that we could have cited? Um, really quite hard to explain, actually. Um, it's obvious why corporate interests aren't advocating because they can't make any money out of it but i don't care i want to improve my health and your health that's what this is about let's let's get back to the evidence that shows us how to do this the knowledge is there the political will with a large p and a small p probably is not quite there yet that needs to change do look at this article for yourself because you can you can read the whole introduction and it tells you about the historical development of kind of how we got to where we are at and it is remarkably interesting 
So there you go. Um, vitamin D recommendations may well be really quite low. Let's hope our highly qualified, highly paid uh, chief medical people and scientific people start reading the latest uh, research. That would be good. Thank you for watching.